So in response to some questions from the steering committee and others, we put together a short presentation on some of the SLCP science. And we'll start here with what we've learned since 2011 when we put together the global assessment. I would say the bottom line is that we were on a good track and evidence since that time is only increased our confidence that there really are very powerful multiple benefits of SLCP reductions, at least as, as strong as we thought for most aspects of those, and in many cases, even stronger. Some of the health estimates in particular have gone, have gone up. We have seen that since 2011, there has been some real positive progress, and hopefully our efforts have contributed to that. There's been in per, some specific examples or large-scale deployment of some of the measures we identified, such as the diesel particulate filters and the progress on HFCs uh, the embodied in the Kigali Amendment. Most of the NDCs uh, include SLCPs, uh, um, especially methane and HFCs. And in general, the SLCP story is not an official part of many of the NDCs yet, but it's really become much more a part of the discussion within both UNFCCC framework and in the climate science community. Um, emissions of HFCs in BC, the current trends are actually cut fairly favorable. We expect both of these to decline. Methane, not such a positive outlook and recently in the recent last few years, emissions or the concentrations have been increasing fairly rapidly, and we uh, expect that to increase under current policies. In part because of that, and because as you look back at the examples of where we've seen real positive action, they have not been so strong for methane, but we would uh, believe that addressing methane is even more important. Um, because it's it's still going up, and because there's new knowledge that makes us uh, really think that it's it's even more important for climate, and uh, more important for uh, public health via. Since the global assessment, uh, we we have not taken any of the original measures out or off the table and decided they were not good. They are all still good, um, but in addition to those that we had before, which included fossil fuel, oil, gas, and coal, uh, exploration and dis distribution and waste measures, uh, agriculture measures have been expanded. So we have some additional knowledge, which we'll go into in a moment. So this slide provides an overview of the SLCP emissions uh, at the global level for over the next four decades. And this baselines that we have developed with the gains model are put over SSPs, which are the shared socioeconomic pathway scenarios developed for the next generation of the IPCC analysis. And you'll see here that methane and HFC emissions are expected to grow continuously while uh, black carbon stabilizes in or declines even by about 10%. The baselines calculated with the GAINS model, which are shown here with the yellow and green solid lines, overlap quite nicely for methane and uh, black carbon with the SSP3 scenarios, uh, reference scenario family uh, developed for the IPCC. While the mitigation scenarios, which are uh, shown here by the red dot for for methane for 2030 and the green dot for black carbon as well as the dotted red line for black carbon they show a very similar potential in absolute terms uh, in, to, to uh, similar like the ssp1 to 5 climate mitigation scenarios which are indicated here by the blue shaded area the difference between the yellow and the green solid line for methane and black carbon. This is a difference in a perspective between 2012 and 2016. The changes in outlook of how the energy scenario will look like as well as the implemented policies 
make this difference. And so you see for black carbon, there's a quite significant decline, a further decline of emissions projected through in, in this uh, green line. And this is mostly because of successful implementation of some of the measures like in transportation and also in residential sector. We will come back to that on some of the next slides. For HFC, you see that there is a much larger difference between the yellow line and the green line, uh, which includes Kigali amendment. And, and this brings actually this, the, the, the new baseline with Kigali amendment very close to the mitigation, maximum mitigation potential estimated in this model runs. Now, a few words about methane. So the first key import, important thing is that emissions are expected to continue. For methane, are expected to continue increasing over the next decades if no further action is taken. The key emission sectors are agriculture, oil, gas, and oil exploration and distribution and, and waste sectors. They really take over 95% of total um, total emissions at the global level. The distribution varies uh, across regions and uh, some of the sectors like coal exploration is much more important in Asia, for example, than, than in some of the other regions. Oil and gas emissions are generally uh, important for Northern Hemisphere and uh, in some areas of Middle East and in Africa. Waste is equally important everywhere, just as agriculture. Uh, apart from uh, maybe rice paddies that are uh, regionally different also. In terms of key mitigation opportunities, about 50% of emissions uh, could be reduced by 2030 if strong action directed, uh, especially at oil, gas and coal sector, as well as waste uh, would be developed. And uh, we'll come back to that later. In terms of updates and changes since 2011, one important um, element is that there's been a lot of new work done for agriculture and there are new studies showing that uh, for enteric fermentation, which is one of the key sources of methane from agriculture, there are further opportunities to reduce emissions. And in that respect, the WMO uh, UNEP assessment of 2000. 10 was uh, a bit pessimistic, so there's new opportunities. Beyond that, there is also new science that um, tells us uh, forcing of methane is higher and uh, the role of methane in climate and air quality has been um, even more pronounced in some of the latest research. So this slide illustrates the, the, the change in, in baseline emissions um, first, in the baseline emissions between 2000 and 2030 at a global level and shows also the sectoral distribution. It's important to see here the three blocks of colors, uh, the sort of violet uh, colors, which indicate the uh, agriculture sector, which is about 40% of, uh, of total emissions, then the blue, areas which represent the oil, gas and coal uh, exploration and, and distribution. And then the yellow or brown area at the end, this is uh, the top of this chart. It's the waste sector. The other contribution comes from combustion, which is the green area combustion in uh, residential uh, for, for cooking and heating, especially of biofuels and coal. And a very small contribution from transportation, which is a red line in here. The, as we see here, there's a continuous increase of emissions over 20% by 2030 in the current baseline. And there's a very significant mitigation opportunity that is uh, about 50%, nearly 50%. And that most of that, as you see, comes uh, from the oil and gas and waste, as I already mentioned earlier, while very little abatement has been calculated um, for agriculture while some of the more recent work shows there is some more potential. So that's one of the areas where we, we could spend some more time uh, updating also these, this calculation. And in a minute, we will come back to um, highlighting also, also that particular element. We see also a gray area here that is a contribution of the CCC partner countries. It's about 50%. So roughly speaking, continuous growing with all of the emissions in its stays. 
at about 50%, go slightly below 50% by 2030 of total global emissions. And also in case of mitigation, nearly 50% or actually slightly above 50% of total potential uh, could be achieved in CCA uh, partner country. Looking at the methane mitigation measures that were included in the original global assessment, we can uh, evaluate cost curves for these because in the follow on near term action plan produced by UNEP in 2011, uh, YASA evaluated the mitigation cost for each measure. So what's shown here is a net societal cost, negative meaning net benefits um, relative to the mitigation cost. And what what's we did here in this study was include both the climate damages associated with climate change and public health and agricultural losses. So all of these are included um, and converted, monetized and converted to, to dollars amounts, which can then be added together. So a ton of methane reduced anywhere has the same impact and therefore you can make these kind of cost curves where you can look at the net impact of reductions and figure out how many tons can be reduced uh, with a particular net uh, benefit to society or cost to society if it's a positive number. And I, of course I should you know, qualify this before I say anything else that if you chose a different discount rate, uh, you would get a different value. So this is using 4%, what was done in the UNEP near-term action plan and we referred to it as the social planner's perspective. Um, the paper that's referenced there has, has other values. But the main point here is that you can reduce uh, a very large quantities of methane, over 100 megatons here have a net negative cost to society. And essentially everything except the, the wastewater treatment um, have, have very modest costs, if any. So these, the, and, and of course, wastewater treatment, you know, much of the, much of the rationale for doing that is for the water benefits, not for methane reduction. So this is just taking into account the, the societal impact of change in emissions to the atmosphere. And the other thing that you can see is that uh, the biggest sectors here, the, the, the first one there is the waste sector, and then the three very large uh, sections with negative benefits ranging from about $3,500 to about $2,000, those are all in the oil and gas sector. And so those really dominate the total mitigation potential from the UNEP assessment and society as a whole would come out very far ahead in the net for any of these measures. So this kind of study I think is useful in prioritizing you know, where you can get the most uh, benefit when you aim for methane reductions, right? The, the horizontal extent of these tells you the overall potential and anything below the zero line is telling you you're gonna come out way ahead. There are only two measures here which concern the agricultural sector. Uh, one of them is the third bar from the left. It's just a single bar representing just two megatons and that's uh, manure management. And then one is the last set, kind of orangey bars, the last set that's negative, uh, the far right around 112 megaton uh, line. And that represents about six megatons and that's feed changes. So we'll return to that in a moment, but in the original 2011 analysis, the, the mitigation potential from the agricultural sec sector was relatively small. Uh, this, this shows some additional work to look at the potential impact of some of the agricultural mitigation uh, possibilities that were not really included in the original 2011 work with the exception of feed changes that was the only one included and that was fairly small and so you see here that this is a different way of looking at it it's the total benefit worldwide due to reduced methane emissions and that's again associated with their impact on climate air and public health and agriculture the latter two via air quality and this adds some new possibilities, such as worldwide adoption of healthy dietary guidelines put forward, which tend to reduce meat and dairy consumption in those parts of the world where, where we
we currently exceed those guidelines. And so that has a huge potential um, as evidenced by the size of the bar. The unit is not so important in this case. Um, but you know, feed changes was included in the UNEP analysis and something like this, dietary choice, has the potential to be even much, much larger than something like feed changes. There's new, some new work on supplements, which is actually based on a very small sample size yet, so that's a highly speculative one. Um, but there, there are other options within the agricultural sector. There's also reduced food waste that's based on FAO analysis. And that, again, has the potential to really reduce a lot of methane, methane emissions. Um, but in addition to dietary choice, the behavioral one, management best practices has received a lot of scrutiny. And so that's the fourth bar, the second largest here. And again, this has the potential to really reduce methane emissions quite a lot. This analysis that I did here is based on the FAO GLEAM model uh, applied worldwide. The CCAC, as part of the agricultural initiative, has been working with um, working on similar issues. And, and here's one of the results from a joint uh, FAO and New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Center study. Again, using the GLEAM model, and this is really focusing in on Argentina and Uruguay, as you can see. But similarly, they find that when you really go into to depth in individual countries, and there's been work in, in other parts of Latin America as well, you can, by changing um, management practices, improving reproductive health of animals, um, changing grazing patterns, especially in, in, in grass. Uh, pastoral grazing systems, you can have very large reductions. And I think the difference between Uruguay and Argentina here, you know, 41 and 72 percent, gives an idea that this, uh, this, the impact will vary from place to place. I think that's going to be wide, wide uh, broadly true. Uh, but in many places, these will be very large numbers, like in these two example countries here. I'll give now an overview of um, black carbon emissions and uh, key mitigation opportunities, as well as um, some of the changes or updates that have happened since since uh, UNEP uh, 2011 report. As shown already earlier in the presentation, the overall trend is uh, an expectation that emissions would slightly decline and would decline even further if uh, most recent policies are introduced uh, and enforced in, in Asia. So that's about 10% by 2030 compared to uh, 2015. In spite of this ongoing uh, effort and, and reduction, there's still significant mitigation potential available, estimated at uh, somewhere over 60% at the global level and varies between 60 and 70 percent depending depending on the region in terms of key mitigation sectors actually not much has changed since the unip report and the key mitigation is still available in in the sectors like residential cooking and kerosene lightning but we we should note that there's a lot has happened um, in a number of countries policies have been issued to uh, reduce use of solid fuels for cooking and heating. China is one of the examples that promotes uh, reduction of coal use in uh, for heating in rural areas and bans even in some areas, some, some urban areas, use of coal. And the same in uh, South Asia, where uh, active programs to replace biomass with gas for cooking uh, are underway. Similarly, a number of programs uh, in India, Indonesia, Nigeria uh, look into kerosene lightning and reduce uh, its use or subsidies also for, for uh, kerosene in order to, to reduce these emissions or stop using kerosene for lightning. In terms of transport, since in the last decade, a lot of policies were issued uh, and successful policies in North America and Europe that uh, show already now significant reductions of uh, black carbon uh, through introduction of diesel particle filters. And similar policies um, have been introduced recently in a number of countries in Asia. So we expect that um, transport sector emissions will decline, especially from heavy duty trucks and uh, diesel cars where they uh, are used, which is has been traditionally Europe, 
and uh, also India has followed a very similar path uh, like Europe. The other sectors uh, like open burning of agriculture and, and, and solid waste still require still further action. And in spite of regulation that exists nearly everywhere, banning open burning of agriculture residue and, and solid waste trash, it's still a fairly common practice. In terms of changes since 2011, kerosene lighting that has been mentioned already several times has not been included at the time of analysis in 2011. Um, only a paper two, three years after UNEP assessment highlighted uh, the, the importance of that sector. And it is, has been included by, by CCEC as well as several national programs, as I mentioned already earlier. In terms of new science, there was a lot of work done on uh, producing new regional forcing uh, estimates for black carbon, as well as the uh, seminal work of, of Tammy Bond, or led by Tammy Bond on, on uh, black carbon. I mentioned already DPF programs, which are shown here in, this, in the next bullet. So this is a very important step uh, towards reduction of black carbon and a very successful endeavor. China has modernized coke manufacturing sector and, and promotes also policies of reducing coal use. Both of these have been highlighted in a UNEP assessment as sectors where significant emissions occur and also significant mitigation potential is available. Following Paris agreement in 2015, several countries uh, include black carbon in their um, NDCs. And last but not least, a very uh, significant initiative, Arctic Council, has agreed on over 20% reduction of black carbon emissions by 2030. This slide shows us an overview of sectors and regional distribution of black carbon emissions. The, as I mentioned earlier, the, at the global level, emissions will decline over time. You see here under each of the bars, uh, percentages indicating the, um, the evolution of emissions uh, over time. While the global emissions decline at a, at a regional level, trends are quite different. Most of the reductions uh, occurs in North America and also East, East Asia, although the, the reasons for the, for the reduction are very different. In North America, that's the second bar here, uh, it's mostly North America and Europe. It's transportation that contributes mostly to reduction, expected reduction in the future in the baseline while in East Asia, it's mostly coal in China that in, in recent projections shows a declining trend. In uh, Africa and South, uh, West and Central Asia, an increase uh, is projected because the policies were less aggressive uh, and only recently transportation has received more attention and um, DPF filters are being put also there. In terms of distribution of sources, you see here, uh, two groups of regions. So the first two columns, Latin America, North America, and Europe, indicate a very large share of transportation. This is the red color, and uh, it's about 40% for Latin America and over 30% for North America and Europe. While in Africa and Asia, it's mostly burning of solid fuels. And this is the green color that is uh, over 50% in all of these regions originates from using solid fuels for cooking as well as kerosene lightning in um, 2015. In terms of total mitigation potential, somewhere between 60 and 70%. The CCAC contribution is about 40%, is not shown here on this slide, but at a global level, it's about 40% in the period in 2015 and increases slightly to 43% to in 2030. And in terms of mitigation, the partner countries of CCAC would contribute just under half of the total mitigation potential. So of this 60 to 70% of total emissions, about 30, 35% could be reduced through uh, in partner countries. For HFC, in terms of trends and key sectors, the emissions of HFCs have been increasing strongly, um, especially in the developing countries. There's been a very large increase in, in before 2015. Most of the emissions originated from uh, North America and Europe and, and some of that in East Asia, while there, there is a very strong increase in the last years all over the world. Um, 
not so much anymore in North America and Europe, but uh, Asia has been growing very fast and the expectation is it will continue growing, growing very fast. And so the good news really are the, the Kigali amendment, uh, a policy that has been agreed uh, will bring very significant reductions, assuming proper execution. And although the, the mitigation by 2030, the mitigation will not be as large as uh, the two thirds of cumulative HFC emissions as indicated here, that, that's expected by 2050. It's a very important process that needs to be monitored and, um, and, and carefully evaluated over time. The key sectors, residential air conditioning and refrigeration, in terms of key mitigation opportunities, very significant reduction possible uh, by, by over 80% by um, 2050, and improvements in, in efficiency and the phase down of uh, certain HFCs will, will have uh, significant benefits. And the key uh, component that I mentioned already that was not included in the UNEP thing is that uh, the HFCs were not included simply at that time, and it's only in most recent studies their contribution to forcing and uh, impact of the mitigation was estimated. But this slide illustrates the global trend as calculated with, with the GAINS model. And uh, as I've shown at the very beginning, this is fairly consistent with the trend shown in the SSP3 scenarios in the integrated assessment models that were used for the development of the SSP pathways. That's a very strong increase. And you see here the refrigeration and air conditioning that are dominating sectors and will play even more important role in the future. And a very strong increase. This is the first, the, the top area indicates East and Southeast Asia, where by the end of the period shown in here, 2050, nearly 50% of emissions are, uh, were expected to come from, from this region. And even now, actually in 2015, that represents about 40% of emissions. The emissions in North, uh, North America and Europe are fairly stable and there's only a slight increase in that baseline, while uh, Southwest and Central Asia shows a very significant uh, growth with uh, Latin America and Africa remaining uh, fairly small and representing not more than 20% of emissions at the end of the period. And again, as highlighted already before, a very strong mitigation is expected through Kigali agreement, not much lower than what would be, um, could be achieved if uh, all of the policies would be introduced and measures, known measures would be introduced uh, immediately without any delay. So here we see analysis from the UNEP GAP report of the emissions for the major uh, SLCPs, including co-emissions, as usual. And these are based on the emissions that we talked about earlier when Zig went through the, the various scenarios. So uh, the highest end there is the SSP3, and then the, the next line is, as it says, the GAINS uh, updated policies following from the GAINS model following the International Energy Agency scenario. And then we have mitigation, where the three lines separate out uh, different HFC related policies. So the overall story here is that if you compare without Kigali, the baseline versus the gains, you get about 0.5, about half a degree of averted warming. And that's very, very similar to what we've had, almost identical to what we had in the 2011 global assessment. But in part, that's coincidence. Um, and, and what we have here is a greater share of that reduction stems from methane mitigation because we have included some of the new possible mitigation, especially within the agricultural sector. And a reduced share stems from black carbon related mitigation in part because the updated policies already include some of the progress that we've seen on reducing BC, especially from say the transport sector. So it's, it's somewhat of a coincidence we get the same nearly the same result um, and I think that's you know we've added more methane sectors and we've taken out some of the BC mitigation because it's already happening but the, the overall story from that is still that there's a lot more that can be done relative to 
current projections following the gains IEA line there, and that we can still make a big difference by really ramping down the remaining methane in BC. When we add in the Kigali Amendment, we get on the order of another tenth of a degree, so we can move from 0.5 to 0.6, much as CCAC science has been saying all along. The, there is potential to go a little bit beyond uh, Kigali, which is essentially earlier reductions of the HFCs, and it's a non-trivial amount. I mean, those lines are separated. Uh, it's not going to change the overall picture. So I think we still have confidence that you can get a lot of benefits from reducing SLCPs, but you can see in these that the temperature is kind of plateaus for a little while under the maximum SLCP reduction cases, but then by even the, the 2050 period, which is the end of this chart, it's, it's back on a rising trajectory. And so, as we've always said, SLCP mitigation is not alone or on its own enough to deal with with climate change. So for the big potential SLCP wins in the next five years, as I just mentioned, methane is actually has a greater potential uh, for climate in, in part because we've made some, some progress on BC. Uh, but those measures that were identified in the original assessment to deal especially with the waste sector and with uh, fossil fuel, including coal, as well as oil and gas, uh, those really need to be implemented to get a, a big win for methane. And now we, we have a lot of this new knowledge on possibilities for agriculture. So especially with the focus on waste and agriculture uh, in the, within CCAC now, there's the time would be right to, to try to get some, some substantial progress. And we really need more examples of large scale success to get to the level that we, we've reached for uh, black carbon and for HFC. So I'd just like to say a few words about the black carbon. There's been significant effort to um, reduce emissions from road transportation, diesel vehicles and road transportation in several countries. And um, positive experience in North America and Europe is followed now in Asia. However, off-road diesel engines that's construction, machinery, agriculture is one of the areas that lags behind. Um, although there is some legislation issued, but there's a lot less known about the missions. And in a number of countries, we don't know, we don't understand enough about the structure of, of that sector and uh, the fleet structure. So there's a lot of work um, necessary and, and a significant potential for reduction. In terms of gas flaring, that's something that we discussed already during the UNEP assessment, but um, there was no mitigation assumed at the time. So a new component in, in most recent analysis is also assumptions about improving efficiency of utilization uh, of, of associated petroleum gas and reducing flaring. And at the same time, actually reducing also uh, losses of methane. This is an integrated strategy that uh, that affects both methane and black carbon. So that's a very, very interesting angle. We still have poor understanding both of practices in oil and gas industry in terms of flaring venting and progress in implementation of policies that do exist in, in several regions, as well as uh, some of the uh, cross-regional uh, initiatives that already exist. And also emission from flaring has been measured only in, in few places around the planet. There's no access to, uh, to wells and um, we would need to do a, a little bit more to do that. One, I would maybe mention one um, action or work that, that will start very soon. The European Commission is supporting black carbon action and supports work together with the uh, Arctic Council and AMAP that looks into, um, into the Arctic impacts and opportunities, mitigation opportunities for black carbon. And oil and gas sector is one of the sectors where we will try to look a little closer and, and hopefully understand better situation in Russia and uh, also United States in terms of mitigation opportunities. Then open burning of trash and agricultural waste as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of regulation, but uh, enforcement have been uh, fairly poor 
and we see from the remote sensing data that open burning is still a fairly common practice in large parts of the world and it's not only in the developing world. We have been analyzing recently some of the data for Europe and the large parts of Eastern and Southern Europe, they, this is a fairly common practice. Uh, even in, in uh, Spain, Italy, there is uh, uh, quite a lot of burning. There, there are thousands of fires a year. So this is something that needs to be looked up further, both from the perspective of black carbon emissions as well as um, health and particulate matter emissions. That is uh, one of the major motivations to follow that up uh, in Europe. And um, the last point here about black carbon is um, assuring implementation of existing programs. And we have seen that uh, Dieselgate has shown that's not necessarily black carbon issue, but in general issue uh, of enforcing legislation and measuring success of, of legislation is not trivial. And uh, we've seen from a number of programs introduced across the world for eradicating solid fuel cooking that next generation of stoves is not necessarily these improved or new stoves. So we have to make sure that there's a lasting effect of, of this legislation. The same point about following through and making sure that uh, there's full compliance, yes, holds for HFCs, right? Right. Um, thanks. Thank you.